It's the Big Fatter American Radio Network. I'm Zach Martin with a very special guest, Michael H. Brown. He's the author of 28 books, including bestsellers, The Final Hour, The Other Side, and Lying Waste, The Poisoning of America. His articles have appeared in publications such as The Atlantic, Reader's Digest, Discover, and The New York Times Magazine. He's appeared on many national and local television shows and radio shows, coast to coast. And now he's a guest, a permanent guest, as we talk about Lying Wonders, Strangest Things, his new book, which is available at Amazon. But what's the best way to purchase the book? We'll get that out of the uh, way first. There or at, uh, <clears throat> at spiritdaily.com. That's the website I operate, spiritdaily.com. It actually has the best price. I think that this is the most dangerous part of your career when I think about it. Writing about spiritual things <laughs> can be more dangerous than people realize. It sure can be. Um, you know, I once, at uh, one time I was out in California speaking, and a fellow in Sacramento who had been a Green Beret in Vietnam, and then, you know, was now active in spiritual issues, spiritual warfare, he told me that what, what he went through in Vietnam as a Green Beret was nothing compared to the spiritual warfare he had been undergoing uh, since. So, yeah, it can be pretty um, interesting out there, challenging, but if we handle it in the right way, there's you're assured of uh, a victory and there's no reason for any fear i can attest to that i uh, am also a russian orthodox priest and there's time when i there are times when i have liturgy where i suffer immensely physical uh, i feel like it's a demonic attack i get the cold sweats i get pain shooting up and down my body to the point where i almost want to pass out and then as i continue and just uh, think about christ suffering on the cross I, I seem to be able to be given the strength through the Holy Spirit to continue. But I, I could tell you this, that there are times where I feel like I'm uh, attacked by the devil himself. And then at one point last week, I asked a fellow priest, I go, can the devil actually kill you? I mean, I felt like I was going to die. And he goes, only if God wills so, but that rarely ever happens. So I can, I can, uh, I, I'm a firsthand witness to that. And, 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 uh, so am I, because I came back. Actually, I was writing a book on the mafia in uh, the mafia in Newark area. I was living in New York City at the time in Manhattan, and and uh, and I didn't really believe in this in demons, evil spirits. I I figured, well, I didn't know anything about them. I figured there there might be uh, the, uh, the devil out there, but I don't have to worry. He's busy with Linda Blair, and and I went on with uh, what I was doing, you know, interviewing even hitmen and hiding out with this one guy who would put away dozens and dozens of gangsters. And it was during that period of time, I wasn't a churchgoer for many years, it was uh, that period of time when I felt something attacking me, and I couldn't figure it out. I knew it was something invisible and yet nearly tangible. And that's what actually pushed me back into into church. Mm. Do you think some of the mobsters that you worked with over the years, and maybe uh, what you would call hitmen, were they perfectly possessed? I think I ran into a case or two that uh, that's very plausible. There was a one one fellow I had an interview. He was originally from Jersey, but he was now in a, uh, a, a penitentiary, a state pen in uh, Texas. And let me tell you, this guy was very well known as a hitman. There was a fellow at the FBI at FBI headquarters in Washington who told me that. Uh, he was about as dangerous a person as the agency had ever dealt with. He was a he was a master at at a lot of trades, and uh, and I went down to see him, stone cold killer, and he stared at me with these eyes that were so glazed and gelid and icy that it actually was upsetting my stomach. I became nauseous after half an hour. I had a I had to say, look, I'm I'm taking a break and. And go and, and basically catch my breath for the rest of the the interview. You could just feel something radiating out of those eyes. And that also happened to me when I was riding around the outskirts of New Jersey with a another fellow who was an informant and uh, and had been involved with quite a few contract killings. Same thing. He there was a reptilian nature mm. to his eyes. Mm-hmm. What about the Iceman? Did you ever meet him? No. No, I never did. I, I just focused on this one story, and I, I was fleshing it out by interviewing not only the person who had squealed, who was in witness protection, but those who were trying to find him. 
So it was very interesting. It consumed uh, uh, more than two years full time of, of my life. Was your life ever in danger? Not, not that I could sense, maybe spiritually. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you know, I was threatened a, a time or two, um, but I knew that basically uh, these guys liked seeing their name in print, and, uh, and there was no use. They don't usually go after um, police or, or, or writers or journalists. Of course, you know, that can be famous last words. Right. And but, they, usually, they usually leave clergy alone as well. Yeah. So uh, I can't say I was overwhelmingly uh, nervous at the time back. That was back in the 80s. I did local TV in in New York, uh, some of those shows and so forth. And I did Regis, and I did the Today Show. And, you know, I I, I didn't have a bodyguard with me. I think it was much more dangerous when I was investigating chemical and oil companies. Oh, boy. (laughs) (laughs) I would say so. And then if you add pharmaceutical companies to the list, you're going to end up with cement shoes. And I do mean that seriously. I, 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 my publisher, when I was investigating a chemical, this chemical company, was nervous enough that they had gotten my schedule, perhaps uh, apparently through eavesdropping, that that they uh, wanted to hire a uh, 24-hour bodyguard to be with me as I was doing television, especially in Texas, and I, and and to post the guy outside my hotel room door. Um, nothing ever happened, but. You know, it it can be uh, again. I use the word. It can be dicey out there when you're investigating things like of this nature from from the dark side. Well, when you think about it, and you bring up oil companies, just as a nota bene part of the discussion, uh, when you look at JFK the movie, uh, there's implications that the oil industry is somehow involved in the Kennedy assassination. So these things kind of, or the group of people, are in cahoots. They're these kind of things, or I think it was Nixon. Excuse me, the movie Nixon. I think that there's some sort of uh, veracity or uh, veritas to this sort of legend that exists. Well, I'll tell you this much without naming names. There was one major oil company that I was dealing with and uh, was concerned about. And I found out many years later, because I I could feel something going on, and there were strange noises on my phone at one point uh, in when I was doing a radio interview uh, to Buffalo, New York, in Buffalo, New York. And, uh, and then I find out later on, and I was being trailed. I would see, it, when I went to upstate New York to visit my family, I would see a, uh, a car behind me. Um, while I was doing this book investigating uh, toxic pollution around the country, especially by this firm, I found out later that during that di- time period, they had hired a guy who had been in the CIA's Black Arts Department to be in charge of their security. So, you know, it can get serious, and you, you certainly have to watch your back. Before we uh, move along on, on with our discussion, what is Black Arts? Or Black Ops, did you say? So uh, I heard wrong. Black Arts. Black uh, Arts. Assassination. Oh, I see. So Black Arts, A- A-R-T-S, Black that, Arts. That's right. Is assassination code. Wow, that's very interesting. Because mm-hmm. I've heard the expression black ops, but hey, you learn something new every day. We're talking with Michael H. Brown, the author of Lying Wonder, Strangest Things, and we've got very interesting stories that are contained in this book, which you can get at Mike's website, which again is for the rest of us. Uh, you want to repeat the uh, website again? Spiritdaily.com. That's it, spiritdaily.com. Uh, before we talk about some of the stories that are included in this book, which we're going to cover just about all of them, I want your commentary, your opinion uh, on what's happening right now with Epstein. We just got news about 15 minutes ago that the autopsy found that he had some broken neck bones, which really adds to the, I guess, the conspiracy theories that are going around. I also find it funny, and in this book, Lying Wonder, Strangest Things, you talk about coincidence. There's no such thing as a coincidence. How is it that all the cameras on buses and banks and intersections, they never have a problem, they never malfunction, but a camera that's in a prison that's supposed to maintain security and the safety and well-being of its prisoners, all of a sudden that's not working, and then all of a sudden the guards that are assigned to be on that floor are nowhere to be found for a few hours. Who knows what they're up to? What's your take on all of this? Yeah, and and Friday night, the night before they uh, they found him, they they take his cellmate away. 
Um, you know, it it <laughs> it certainly was a lot that came out a week ago last fr- uh, last Friday with all of these high-powered people whose names are s- suddenly being widely disseminated as being connected with this uh, pedophilia ring. And, you know, I don't know about this broken neck, but, you know, I was reading that the hyoid uh, uh, break that he suffered in his neck, according to the t- autopsy, that a quarter of the men who hang themselves can have that, but, uh, but also that there was one study uh, in India that was uh, years back, but it was out of 264 cases of a hyoid break, that bone in the neck, only 16 were in suicide cases. The rest were strangulation. So, you know, I think you have to look at that and you say, hmm, even, even other studies have shown at most, I think, one-fourth of the men who, who hang themselves had broken hyoids. Um, there's more to be investigated for sure, and I certainly hope it all comes out because I think it, if it does, it'll be the biggest uh, scandal in, in our lifetimes. I heard about Epstein a long time ago. I was listening to Alex Jones. He talked about the pedo plane and all of these things. And Pizzagate was also part of the discussions at one time. And Podesta and his emails and all the weird stuff going around and the disappearing emails, all of that stuff, which also included stuff about UFOs as well. Um, all of those things, people were saying, oh, he's crazy. It's not true. Um, and then he would bring it up Bohemian Grove. Did you investigate Bohemian Grove, any of these pedophile rings, or do you know have any information that maybe the rest of us don't have concerning this subject matter? I don't know about that because, I, I mean, I've written about Bohemian Grove, but I have not. I can't say I, I conducted a full-fledged investigation of it. It certainly is peculiar from both a natural and supernatural standpoint that, you know, they meet so secretively, and, and these movers and shakers from all walks, whether it's uh, high government uh, leaders, even even presidents to secretaries of state, and, and media moguls and Wall Street, all kinds of people meeting in total uh, secrecy. I mean, at Bohemian Grove, they even, that's where they came up with the idea for the Manhattan Project, you know, the first atomic uh, bomb. So, Something's going on there, and what's bizarre is that these men who are meeting there, all of these very well-known types who have a lot of power and a lot of money, um, they have that ritual whereby they call it, the, I think, burning of cares or something ritual, and conducted in front of a, a, a towering owl, I think it's like 12 or 16 feet tall, and it's like an occult ritual. The owl is an occult uh, uh, symbol for a lot of people. And they wear these robes that remind you of somebody conducting a ritual in a coven. So it's strange, uh, strange stuff. Maybe they just don't understand the symbolism of, and they're goofing around and having a good time that week. But I don't know. I'm a little bit suspicious about that. Uh, uh, as well as Bilderbergs and, and so forth. Yeah, that's plenty of subject material to talk about down the road when we, when we get there. It's, it's always exciting to explore these kind of things. I, I try not to waste too much time. I find it interesting. And then when you're listening to it on the radio, very fascinating. Let's talk about chapter one of your book, Lying Wonders, Strangest Things. And uh, uh, these stories about people who vanish into thin air. Now, before you comment on uh, what you write about, I just want to think uh, about the biblical things of people vanishing in the air. And today is um, August 15th, the Feast of the Assumption of Mary into Heaven, or the Dormition, as we call it in the Orthodox Church. However, depending on what calendar, uh, there's some differences. So today in the West, we celebrate the Assumption of Mary. There is the Book of Enoch, where Enoch is assumed. And I think also uh, Elijah is assumed into heaven, too. So we have these stories of people just disappearing out of sight, and then, of course, there's the ascension. So um, the idea of people disappearing is nothing new. This has gone on for ages and ages. How do you discuss this particular topic? Well, you know, spirits can do a lot of things. They're very deceiving, and, and including cloaking somebody with invisibility. And whether it's a good spirit or bad one. Now, of course, with, with the Virgin Mary or with uh, 
with uh, other figures you mentioned there. Those are holy manifestations drawn up into uh, heaven, I believe. But in these uh, other cases, like the one I write about in the Philippines, where this boy was vanishing and reappearing and vanishing, it seemed clearly uh, that a demonic spirit was involved, and uh, it could just kind of cover over him, and, and you couldn't see him. He was gone. He'd be gone for minutes, hours sometimes, uh, sometimes most of the most of the day in front of credible witnesses, it's not just his parents and siblings, but even a minister who was holding him at the time he disappeared, and even his entire classroom and teacher just vanished while he was standing in front of them. And it was only later when he attended a uh, an evangelical-type uh, service that he was, quote, delivered, unquote, from this beautiful woman in spirit that he had been seeing in apparition, and he saw it turn into a hideous creature, and that was the end of her, and that was the end of his disappearing. I've listened on the radio where people are disappearing in national parks. Uh, do you have any idea what's going on there? You know, I've read some on that. Uh, again, I'm no expert. I spend my, a lot of time myself in, in forest. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's difficult because, obviously, in a forest, especially some of these parks with cliffs and so forth, it's easy to... I know I myself have gotten lost. It's easy to get lost, disoriented. Uh, there are wild animals out there. Uh, there are cases that seem to go a little bit beyond uh, a naturalistic, uh, uh, you know, explanation in the sense that there'll be areas where they also have spotted strange lights in the sky or, quote, Bigfoot, unquote, creatures, you know, these cryptids that they talk about, mm. which I think are a spiritual phenomena, at least uh, in large, large, large part. Um, I don't know, I guess. Certainly a lot have disappeared in, in parks and uh, without, a, without a trace. Well, and then they go in search of people and they find, I've heard these stories where they find missing little kids miles and miles away from where they went missing and just waiting for somebody to come and find them. It's almost as if they went through a portal. Well, there was, there, there's a, uh, there's a, Small forest in uh, in uh, in Transylvania of all places, where you know they spot all of this phenomena, like I mentioned, UFOs and so forth, uh, ghostly apparitions, uh, kind of hear demonic shrieks and so forth. And uh, uh, legend has it, if it's legend, that uh, this this shepherd entered the the forest with uh, a flock of of sheep and just vanished, was never seen again. This is only, this is a very small forest. Mm -hmm. I forget how many square miles, but not many. And uh, and other people have gone there and been gone for a long time, and then they'll show up uh, quite a bit later wearing the same clothes, but clothes that are still, you know, uh, fresh, mm -hmm. as if they this just happened to them. Um in other words, yes, like they went into some other portal or meta dimension. You you have a highway um, that used to be uh, uh, Highway 666 running uh, through parts of western New Mexico up to Utah and Colorado, where you also had people who would who would just be gone for a long time, sometimes days, and then just show up and not have any idea what happened. Wow. So, and that's in forest land also. So these these portals are all over the world, I would suppose. Do you, do you know what the actually what these portals are? It seems like I, I don't. How would you describe it? Sort of like defining gravity. How do you just how do you define gravity? What's a portal? Well, you know, I guess in theory, it's an ent entrance uh, way or exit to uh, another dimension. You know, one that perhaps some people hypothesize is used by beings from other realities, other planets, or whatever you, you want to say, because you'll, you'll have a portal to me can be anywhere in any size. You can have one in your house, you know, if it's, if it's, if it's haunted. They're coming through a, a portal, but there are, are large ones in certain areas, and I think that they're induced. They're created by ritualistic practices. Mm. They're, they're common over uh, around Indian burial grounds where witches uh, do 
have their covens and so forth, and uh, or where there has been massive crime, it seems to lend itself to an opening in the spiritual wall in the in the separation. Um, how it actually functions in relation to something like gravity or time and space, uh, I don't think anyone in, could know. But I think that portals are involved with a lot of UFOs because they seem to just appear and disappear and. And and, and uh, we've had reports of so many types of creatures that that you must be talking in in uh, many cases of a spiritual phenomenon. Is there uh, are there any types of people that are more susceptible to being a victim of these sort of occurrences, disappearances, or uh, going through portals, the wrong place at the wrong time, perhaps, or being abducted by UFOs? All of those stories that you hear from time to time. Uh, in some cases, I can't really speak in the majority of cases, but you will find people uh, people who have been involved in occult practices, you know, in ex- the extremely dangerous practice of Ouija boards mm-hmm. or going to seances, going to fortune tellers, will have things like this uh, occur around them. Um, although it's also happened to, like, in the Philippines, that a case I mentioned, Cornelio uh, uh, closer. He was just a young boy. He wasn't involved in any of that. It occurred in 1952. Uh, now, it could have been like a family curse or whatever, mm. But uh, and I believe curses do operate. Um, but, you know, there's you can't always pinpoint any particular practice or, or proclivity. I think the Ouija board is a very interesting topic because the way it was presented when I was a little kid, it was just another game. You'd go to Toys R Us or wherever the toy store was, and you see the Ouija board. Then you see a couple of television shows where, I don't know, maybe it was the Partridge family or the Brady Bunch. They're messing around with the Ouija board, and so you go get one. And I remember uh, one particular time, I didn't buy the Ouija board. It's like I didn't want any part of it. It's like, ah, I'm not really interested in it. It sounds stupid. Maybe we played with them. A few times when I was a little kid, but this is when I was a young adult. I was out in the east end of Long Island, uh, right in the Riverhead area. And and there were um, Indians that roamed that area many moons ago, so to speak. And there was this gigantic duck. You ever heard of the big Long Island duck? It, it was it was a, just, a, uh, I guess, a roadside type of building. And they yeah. sold eggs and stuff in there. Gigantic duck. Well, mm. they wanted to save the duck, so I did this. Uh, remote broadcast for 104 hours. I was going to sit on the duck and start this Guinness Book of World Record of sitting on top of the duck. It was a great idea. Yeah, when you're 23, people are going to talk to you, uh, talk you into that kind of stuff. <laughs> so I'm up on the duck one night, and it's dark. There's overcast. It starts to rain. I have, uh, I guess, a lean-to over me to protect me from the elements. And uh, these two listeners come up with a Ouija board. They're twins. And we start playing with the Ouija board. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, lightning and thunder is going off. I'm like, forget it. I don't want to play with that anymore. (laughs) Um, And and it's I think sometimes we do things out of ignorance because we don't know any better. But since that happened to me over 30 years ago, I'm like, (laughs) don't even go there, man. We we sure do. Back in the mid-1970s, my first book was on psychic phenomena. Back when I wasn't a churchgoer, when I was spiritually blind, when I was quite naive, and I, I just as I, I was a newspaper reporter, and I was just interested to see if there was actually any concrete evidence of a spiritual world. So I wandered into the realm of parapsychology and psychic phenomena and haunted houses. And I was, uh, quote, investigating, unquote, one in Binghamton, New York. I think it was on Oak Street there with a fellow who was a, an a associate professor at, at the State University in Binghamton. And we were stupidly, playing with a Ouija board, trying to find out what might be behind this haunting. And all of a sudden, in the middle of of asking questions, you know, who are you, and so forth, um, the room became just ice cold. And a thermometer even showed that the temperature had plummeted like 20 or 30 degrees. It was cold in there. And uh, I'd walked over to where the thermostat was, and all of a sudden, uh, I... I was on the other side of the room, and I didn't know what happened. And this this, uh, friend of mine who was doing research with me, he said that I just kind of like was lifted and whisked across uh, across the room. I mean, more than than 10 feet. Um, 
So those things can be dangerous. They can be very hazardous. I got myself in in quite a bit of uh, personal trouble by messing with it, and I urge people not to play with Ouija boards and not to watch uh, uh, a lot of these ghostly-type shows and so forth Mm. that, that can ensnare you. I also uh, would be very careful what you have on the radio as you go to bed at night. I would listen to Father Malachi Martin and fall asleep when he was on our bell and have some of the strangest dreams you could ever imagine. So don't do that either. Make sure you're conscious because it will seep into your subconscious. There's the other thing that you want to do is avoid the uh, places that people talk about in legendary conversations. And I know you know this place. And I've been there. I was just there last week um, during the day. Clinton Road in New Jersey. Uh-huh. It's in the book of weird New Jersey, whatever it is. It's a stretch of uh, roadway that goes from Route 23 to uh, the other side of it. I don't know what the other side of, uh, of it is. It's in West Milford, New Jersey, um, on the border of, I guess, Passaic and Sussex County. Does that sound about right? Mm-hmm. And I, I remember a long time ago, and, and I think it's, it's something to do with the time of day when you travel on this. I got the bright idea. It was Halloween. I wanted to scare the kids. Mm -hmm. And my daughter would always laugh like when she was a baby. I'd go, oh, no, creepy tree. And she'd give this big belly laugh. And we're going down this road. There's snow all over the place. It's a gray night. There's some, I guess, snow falling down. I got all the kids in the car. And there are the creepy trees. And we're going down this road. There's no leaves. So now you can see all the different parts that come up along Clinton Road. Very weird road. Um... It gave me the creeps. I never went back there in that type of weather or that type of uh, that time of day ever again. I don't know if time matters, but I was just there last week. And the time before I was on that road, I almost got ran off the road. But there were kids hiking along that trail. Um, I would suggest that it's probably not a good idea for me to go down that road anymore. Although there are people who live on the road, so I can't even figure that one out. They must know about the legend. Yeah. What do you think about Clinton Road? Well, I've been I've been on it. You know, once I was speaking in the Saddlebrook area, and I decided to to see what it was about. It was during the day, um, and I was with my wife and uh, one of my daughters. And it's eerie. It's it's uncanny. I didn't feel good afterwards. It's like this grit rubs off on you, the spiritual uh, grit. There's a, a lot of people claim to see a phantom pickup truck and oh and uh and we did um now i didn't see anything else i can't prove it wasn't a real truck but it was just there suddenly and and my daughter said there's that truck they talk about is and, it a black truck and yes yeah it, 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 it i had the same experience and then it went over to the right on 23 north it it almost gets right up on your bumper it, it came out of nowhere yes yeah i mean <laughs> it, it was a real truck i saw it but I'm not surprised. It was a Dodge Ram truck. I I know that for sure. Yeah, and 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 once again with Clinton Road, you have history. You have a crime history there. You have Indian rituals there. You have uh, allegedly witches uh, conduct rituals there, and then you have all of these cryptid stories, uh, di- different weird animals and creatures. Again, mm-hmm. UFOs, orbs of light, and so forth. So it's it uh, you know kind of all weaves together, dovetail. Well, yeah, that, that's uh, added to the fact that there used to be a jungle habitat in the area. And right. legend has it that the animals crossbred and you have these weird beasts that are in the woods. Uh, that, that goes all over that section. Then there's the, the, um, the telephone poles with the weird stuff on top. And we pretty much figured out that it was probably uh, a high wire uh, kind of, you know, the electrical guys putting stuff on top of the poles. You can figure that one out for yourself. It's pretty easy to figure out. But yes, those covens and the happenings on that road, I, I, I would never want to hike down it. That's for sure. I was no, and surprised. People, people should not play with it. Uh, I, was, I actually regretted uh, going there because it caused tremendous tension uh, afterwards. And, and, and that's what these spirits do. They latch on. They create the uh, tension, flashpoints of anger, uh, anxiety, mm. depression. And so you have to be extremely careful with this stuff and not toy with it. Yeah, I guess it, you're right. It's a bad idea to play around with it. On the other hand, I think to myself, well, I know what I believe and I'm spiritually strong. And I'm probably one of those people that, well, you know, when you get ordained as a priest, you have minor orders. And one of the minor orders is exorcist. And we're not supposed to do any exorcists, exorcisms 
unless the bishop tells us to do. You have to have permission. One of the dangerous things I find these days are these people that call themselves exorcists. Exorcist. Um, maybe um, they'll use like they're from the Order of St. Michael. You know the old Catholic movement? There's this mm-hmm. old Catholic movement. We, yeah. we, uh, we disagree with Rome, so therefore we're going to do our own thing. And there's where these dangerous heresies uh, spring forth. And the next thing you know, they're calling themselves exorcist. And I got approached by these guys. I'm like, look, you know something? This is nothing to mess around with. It, unless you are in true apostolic succession, unless you are a Roman Catholic or Orthodox priest and an actual bishop orders you to do that, you better not do it. <laughs> I'm well, telling you right now. I, I think you're totally right, because you can... Uh... And 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 uh, on the other hand, I don't want to scare people myself with what I'm saying about these places, because in the name of Jesus, um, the devil flees. But uh, a lot of things can happen in between that. And when it comes to doing an exorcism, you're absolutely, totally correct. You you don't mess with uh, that type of thing without having, without being in obedience and without knowing what you're doing. That's right. And you also have to. There's a protocol that you must follow. Uh, with that kind of stuff. Well, that's just a sidebar to what we're talking about on Clinton Road. There are many lying wonders and the strangest things that you'll find in the book by Michael H. Brown, Lying Wonders, Strangest Things, which is available on Amazon.com. And one more time, Michael's going to tell us where to go online, which is? Uh, SpiritDaily.com, like a daily newspaper. Next week, we're going to get to the No Tell Hotel and various other lying wonders and strangest things.